The FBI is calling China the greatest threat to America. A U.S. Navy carrier strike force patrols the South China Sea. Plus, Hong Kong's new national security law is way worse than anyone thought. Welcome to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. Well, it's Christmas in July, and this month, Santa came in the form of FBI Director Christopher Wray. And the gifts? Some serious truth bombs about China. In a speech at the Hudson Institute on July 7th, Director Wray called China the greatest threat to America. The greatest long-term threat to our nation's information and intellectual property and to our economic vitality is the counterintelligence and economic espionage threat from China. It's a threat to our economic security and by extension to our national security. And get this. We've now reached the point where the FBI is opening a new China-related counterintelligence case about every 10 hours. Every 10 hours? I guess that's why coffee sales are way up over at the FBI. But Ray offered his own caffeine-free wake-up call to the American people. But if you think these issues are just an intelligence issue, or a government problem, or a nuisance largely just for big corporations who can largely take care of themselves, you could not be more wrong. It's the people of the United States who are the victims of what amounts to Chinese theft on a scale so massive that it represents one of the largest transfers of wealth in human history. If you're an American adult, it is more likely than not that China has stolen your personal data. That's why I recommend creating so much personal data, they can't tell which one is real. Of course, the Chinese Communist Party was shocked by Director Ray's outlandish accusations. Ray's remarks ignored basic facts and were full of political lies which fully exposed his deep-rooted Cold War mentality and ideological prejudice. China is firmly opposed to this. But there was another sore point for my pal Zhao Lijian here. Ray also called out China's Operation Fox Hunt, which, while it sounds like a plot point in the Metal Gear franchise, is actually quite different. Here's how Zhao describes it. China's launch of its overseas Operation Fox Hunt and the recapture of suspects who fled abroad is safeguarding the dignity of the law and social justice. But who are these suspects who fled abroad? We're talking about political rivals, dissidents, and critics seeking to expose China's extensive human rights violations. Hundreds of these fox hunt victims that they target live right here in the United States, and many are American citizens or green card holders. The Chinese government wants to force them to return to China, and China's tactics to accomplish that are shocking. So they're not just setting out a trap of milk and cookies? In the past, their family members, both here in the United States and in China, have been threatened and coerced, and those back in China have even been arrested for leverage. I will take this opportunity to note that if you believe the Chinese government is targeting you, that you're a potential fox hunt victim, please reach out to your local FBI field office. Wait, the FBI wants to help these anti-China criminals? Do U.S. officials make such a statement in hopes that the United States will become a haven for fleeing criminals? Well, if they're fleeing the CCP, like the Hong Kong protesters, I have a feeling that America would happily become a haven for those criminals. But it wasn't just Christopher Wray speaking out about China. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was back at it too. He called out the Chinese Communist Party for banning foreigners from traveling to Tibet. Hmm, I wonder why the party doesn't let outsiders into Tibet. I mean, Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, has repeatedly been ranked the happiest city in China, according to a poll conducted by Chinese state-run media. And would they lie? So obviously, the Communist Party doesn't want foreigners in Tibet because they don't want them to see how happy Tibetans are. They might get jealous. Oh, and also, they don't want foreigners to get altitude sickness. See, they just want what's best for foreigners. Which is why it's so insulting 
that the U.S. is putting a travel ban on Chinese officials who put a travel ban on Tibet. So, in response to that, the Chinese Communist Party announced that it will put a travel ban on U.S. officials who put a travel ban on Chinese officials who put a travel ban on Tibet. The world is run by five-year-olds. Hey, I know how to solve U.S.-China tensions. I'll just let Xi Jinping play with my toys. Wait, no. Then I'll just say my toys have been part of his territory since ancient times. For the first time ever, the U.S. government is sanctioning Chinese officials under the Global Magnitsky Act. This is huge. Yes, the Treasury Department is sanctioning four current and former Communist Party officials in Xinjiang, as well as the Xinjiang Public Security Bureau. That's for their human rights abuses against the Uyghurs and other Muslim ethnic minorities in Xinjiang. And these sanctions mean that any property or money that these officials have in the U.S. is blocked, and no U.S. citizens or companies can do business with them. Corrupt Chinese Communist Party officials have spent years squirreling away money overseas. So now that the U.S. government is directly going after their money, that's a big deal. Secretary of State Pompeo is also blocking these officials from being able to travel to the U.S. Tick tock, tick tock, the clock is running out on the Chinese Communist Party because Pompeo is also talking about banning tick tock. See what I did there? The US government is looking into allegations tick tock violated children's privacy. On Monday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the United States was certainly looking at banning the app. He suggested it shared information with the Chinese government. Tick tock denied the accusation. Any potential ban would be a heavy blow for TikTok. It said last year that 60% of its 26 million monthly active users in the US are aged 16 to 24. US lawmakers have also raised national security concerns over TikTok's handling of user data. Pompeo also suggested there might be other Chinese apps that need to be looked at, but he didn't give more details. I'm going to go with WeChat. You know, the app that tracks your conversations, your location, and everything you buy. Possibly that's also a concern. And coming up after the break, a U.S. Navy carrier strike force heads to the South China Sea. And guess who's angry about that? Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. So, what did you do over the 4th of July weekend? Set off illegal fireworks? Go out and watch other people's illegal fireworks? Stay at home like you were supposed to? And watch videos of other people's illegal fireworks? Well, the US Navy celebrated by deploying two aircraft carrier strike groups to the South China Sea. You know, the South China Sea. Where over the past decade, the Chinese Communist Party built a bunch of artificial islands and then put missiles on them. Also, the Communist Party claims that pretty much the entire South China Sea belongs to China. To which other countries are like, no? So for years, the US Navy has been sending ships to conduct freedom of navigation exercises in the South China Sea. To remind China of America's strong commitment to keeping the region free and open to international trade. Last year, the U.S. Navy conducted nine of these freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. And it's not just the U.S. Over the last few years, countries like the U.K., France, Australia, and Japan have all conducted freedom of navigation operations there. But this is the first time the U.S. has sent two aircraft carriers to the South China Sea in six years. U.S. aircraft carrier strike groups look like this. So, yeah, it's a pretty strong reminder of that commitment. Over the July 4th weekend, the U.S. Navy sent both the USS Nimitz and the USS Ronald Reagan carrier strike groups. That's terrifying. But even those great ships are vulnerable. Because, as my favorite Chinese state-run media, The Global Times, reminds America that China has a wide selection of anti-aircraft carrier weapons that it could use. You know, just saying. But the U.S. Navy says they're not worried. Now, according to a U.S. Pacific Fleet spokesman, this U.S. Freedom of Navigation operation was not in response to any political or world events. But it 
did happen to come exactly as China was conducting its own naval exercises in the South China Sea, near the disputed Paracel Islands. Probably just a coincidence. And as the Global Times says, probably the U.S. only sent its navy as a mere show to make up for its loss of face regarding epidemic control, and because the U.S. knows it has lost its Hong Kong card following China's national security legislation. I mean, I get it. When I'm feeling sad and ashamed, I also lash out by sending aircraft carrier strike groups. Now, every time that there's one of these freedom of navigation operations, there's a lot of headlines about how these actions are angering Beijing or heating up tensions in the area. But that ignores what the Chinese Communist Party has been doing over the last six months to escalate the situation in the South China Sea. For example, by using the time when the world was distracted by the coronavirus to pursue their South China Sea ambitions. In the last few months, the Chinese Coast Guard has rammed two Vietnamese fishing boats, sinking one of them. They've also harassed a Malaysian oil drill ship, and their maritime militia has been swarming an island controlled by the Philippines. And there are increasing concerns that the Chinese Communist Party is planning to establish an air defense identification zone over the South China Sea. That would let them conduct more air patrols over the South China Sea and establish authority over the airspace in the region, something that would lead to the U.S. conducting essentially freedom of navigation flights in the area. You know what the real problem in the South China Sea is? I know, it seems like the problem is that the Chinese Communist Party has been accelerating its years-long attempt to take over the region. But it's actually Trump. According to the CNN opinion article, Trump is at fault because he seems to have no interest in negotiating any standstill agreement with China in the region or guaranteed free passage of ships of all nationalities through and in the South China Sea. Well, for one, free passage of ships is already guaranteed throughout the South China Sea, since it's international waters. And that's the whole point of freedom of navigation operations. But if anyone still thinks that the Chinese Communist Party would honor any standstill agreement in the South China Sea, even if they signed it and pinky sweared, maybe they should take a look at how the CCP is honoring the Sino-British Joint Declaration in Hong Kong. The British get it now, but it's a little too late. And stay tuned, because after the break, we'll look at how Beijing's new national security law is turning Hong Kong into mainland China. Welcome back to China Uncensored. I'm Chris Chappell. Hong Kong is doing great from the perspective of the Chinese Communist Party. Beijing released the dreaded national security law that completely rewrites the rules of Hong Kong. And it seems to be going well. Yep, definitely quieted the unrest in the city. Everyone knew the national security law was going to be bad, but it's worse than anyone predicted. Joining me today is Anthony Daprin, a Hong Kong-based writer, lawyer, and photographer. He wrote a new book called City on Fire, The Fight for Hong Kong. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you. So I just want to check with this new national security law. It's, it's it's okay that we're talking, right? You, you are in Hong Kong. Yeah, I, I am in Hong Kong, but I'm willing to confirm that I'm not going to collude with you to uh, cause the Hong Kong people to hate the Chinese government today. So I think we're clear. I mean, I love the Chinese Communist Party, especially Xi Jinping. So I don't know why there would be any problem. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all good. Yeah. So uh, this, this new national security law, why don't you give us the uh, terrifying highlights? Uh, yeah, look, the new national security law does much more than just create uh, four new criminal offences under Hong Kong law, which it does uh, in very broad, um, sweeping and vague terms. Uh, acts of secession, subversion, uh, terrorism and colluding with foreign forces are now all crimes in Hong Kong, punishable uh, with up to life imprisonment. Um, and they're defined very loosely to enable the authorities to apply them uh, to many different uh, situations. Um, but that's just the start. Um, the law also uh, empowers uh, China's national security bodies to set up an agency here in Hong Kong and to operate here in Hong Kong. 
it creates a new national security commission for Hong Kong, uh, on which it's just been announced today that um, the head of the central government liaison office in Hong in Hong Kong, sent here from Beijing, will be sitting as an advisor, as a national security advisor. It dispenses with many traditional uh, procedural protections. Um, under Hong Kong law for criminal suspects. Um, it enables, in some serious cases, the mainland to assume jurisdiction over a case and take suspects from Hong Kong back to the mainland for prosecution and trial. Um, it allows the Hong Kong chief executive to hand pick the panel of judges who will be hearing national security cases, so um, effectively destroying the, the separation of powers and independence of the judiciary. Uh, and last of all, the power to interpret the law uh, rests not with the Hong Kong courts, but with the national People's Congress in Beijing. And so they are ultimately the ones that decide how this law will be interpreted and applied. So it really is a, a sea change to the legal and political landscape in Hong Kong um, and a significant change to the rule of law here. Well, I think what's also shocking about the national security law is that it can apply to pretty much anyone in the world, right? That's right. The law has extraterritorial application, which means that uh, if anyone anywhere in the world breaches the law and it, they do that in a way that is directed at Hong Kong, as the word the law uses, then they will be um, liable under the law. And so if that person uh, travels back to, to Hong Kong or to China, they may be arrested for breaking the law. So I probably shouldn't make a trip back to Hong Kong anytime soon. You need to rethink your travel plans carefully, that's right. Well, fortunately, the coronavirus had made me rethink all my travel plans. Uh, yeah. So how is this going to affect Hong Kong protests? Look, it's it's going to have a significant impact on Hong Kong protests. Already we saw on the 1st of July, the first day in which the law came into force, Hong Kong police were wielding a new purple warning banner, which read uh, a warning to the crowds that they were chanting slogans or waving banners that showed evidence of a sec secessionist or subversive intent and were subject to arrest. So immediately a whole range of protest activity and, and speech activity uh, that was perfectly legal in Hong Kong a few days ago um, is now potentially a, a crime under the national security law. So it very much changes what is and isn't permissible uh, for political protest in Hong Kong. And, and, and I dare say we'll, we'll change the way that people engage in, in political protest going forward here. So China had promised Hong Kong a degree of autonomy when it re when it took power. Why do you think they felt this was necessary? Clearly, uh, the events of last year, the open defiance of, of Beijing rule over Hong Kong in particular that was shown through the protest last year, alarmed Beijing. At the same time, we have an administration in Beijing at the moment who are very strongly centralizing in terms of their view of power and their view of Beijing's control over the peripheries of, of, of the empire. And I think those things combine to um, make Beijing conclude they need to have a very powerful and assertive demonstration of their control over Hong Kong. And that's resulted in this, this demonstration of that control through enacting this new law. So really, it seems like anyone who has been involved in these protests or anyone going forward really runs the risk of potentially getting sent to mainland China for trial and ending up in prison for life. That's right. I mean, the one silver lining of this law, if it could be said to have one, was that it does not have a retrospective effect. So the law state clearly states that it only applies to uh, behavior from the date of the law going forward. Uh, one of the Beijing pro-Beijing spokespeople said it was sort of offering people the opportunity to, to have a clean slate, to wipe clean the, the, the slate of their past behavior. Uh, but what that means is you're quite right that anyone going forward who is engaging in behavior critical of the Hong Kong or Beijing governments may potentially become exposed under this new national security law. And if Beijing considers it a, an extreme case or a serious case, they might exercise their power to assume jurisdiction over that and, and take that person back to the mainland for trial. Well, I know the Chinese Communist Party has never lied about anything before, but for someone like Joshua Wong, even if he were to be quiet from now on, do you really think Beijing is going to let him go away? Um, look, I, I, I think that if he was genuinely quiet from now on, they, they would not have a basis to, to charge him under the law. But I, I don't think that that's Joshua's nature. He's already clearly stated that he plans to continue his activism going forward. And so he may well find himself falling foul of the law sooner or later. Uh, there are elections coming up in Hong Kong. How do you think this changes the game? 
The national security law really changes the way that Hong Kong's pro-democracy uh, legislators uh, can run for an election and then behave when they get into office. Traditionally, the, the pandemocrats have run on, a, on an anti-government platform and, and on a pro-democracy platform. Uh, their key role as, as a permanent opposition party has been to criticize the government. And now it's increasingly looking like some of the actions that they've engaged in, such as promoting democracy, such as criticizing the government, such as filibustering inside the Legislative Council chamber, may potentially be crimes under this national security law, may potentially be considered subversion. And so they're going to have to have a complete rethink of the way that they position themselves, uh, the way that they campaign, um, and the way that they behave when they get into office. And we're already seeing an impact in terms of many of the pro-democracy legislators being reluctant to speak out publicly about this national security law for fears that if they criticize it, that might result in them being disqualified from running for office. So it really is a big change for, for Hong Kong's pan-democrats. Do you think there's anything the international community can do? Clearly, the international community was very critical of this law from the moment it was announced, and they weren't able to stop Beijing enacting it. And it doesn't even appear that they were able to stop Beijing toning it down in any way. It's about as extreme as it could be. But I don't think that means that the international community should give up. I think that it certainly helps that the international community continues to pay attention to what's happening in Hong Kong. It's always better for there to be light rather than darkness cast on what's happening. And I think also the various offers um, of paths out, escape routes, if necessary, for Hong Kongers through uh, what Britain are doing with their, uh, their BNO passport scheme and other countries have indicated they will do, provide at least uh, some degree of reassurance or comfort to Hong Kongers that if they need it, they do have options should it, uh, should it come to that. Do you think how the Chinese Communist Party has treated Hong Kong has affected how the international community views China? Look, I think it's part of a, a, a bigger picture. Um, certainly uh, with the protest of last year, it's been a very visually arresting and prominent part or prominent symbol of, of, of China's um, uh, flexing of its power uh, around the world. But it's also coming in the context of a number of other things that are adjusting the relationships between China and the rest of the world, such as the US-China trade war, uh, such as the, the recent clashes between Indian and Chinese troops in, in the disputed border areas there such as uh, foreign influence concerns in Australia, such as the, the Meng Wanzhou case and the, the, the arrest of two Canadians in China um, in, in connection with, with Canada's relationship with China. So it's, it's, a, it's part of a, a tapestry of, of much broader pattern that, that, that's clearly showing there's some kind of realignment going on uh, between China and, and many of the other major countries in the world. Thanks again for joining me today, Anthony. Uh, again, the book is City on Fire, The Fight for Hong Kong. It's been a pleasure having you on with me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. And thank you for watching. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.